Heavenly Father, we ask your Spirit's presence here today to touch our minds, to touch our hearts, to open us to you completely. We praise you for your presence. We praise you for the opportunity to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I recently bought a Tesla. And for those that you know, I've been going about six years in a car without air conditioning. A great Toyota Camry that has 300,000 miles, but no air conditioning in the summertime in North Carolina wasn't the greatest in the world. So I got this Tesla, and a Tesla is an amazing car. It's fun to drive. You know, go zero to 60 in three seconds. It's, it's amazing, and I love driving past the gas stations and looking and see how much that gas is and realize I don't have to stop anymore. And when I, when I got it, Amy was a little bit afraid of it when I first got it. And I'll be honest, that was partially my fault. Um, the first time I took her out in the car, I, I, I did a zero to 60 in three seconds without telling her I was going to do it. She was a little bit worried about it. But then something happened. Her car had to go into the shop for some service, and she wasn't about to drive my Camry with no air conditioning, so she said, I'm going to have to drive the Tesla. And she drove the Tesla. She had, before she even made it to work, she said, I love this car. <laughs> I get to drive it now on the weekends. During the week, I'm back in a Toyota Camry with no air conditioning. It would be during the week when I'm wearing a suit to court. I'm in a car with no air conditioning. But that zero to 60 in three seconds is pretty exciting. If, if you're not ready for it, and that was part of the reason why I didn't warn her, was because if, I was, if I'm honest, I'll be honest with you, I kind of didn't want her to like the car, because I didn't want her to drive the car. But that, that feeling of terror when you hit zero to 60 in three seconds when you're not expecting it, that, that feeling of terror has now, for her, turned into a rush of feeling alive. We all have moments like that, moments when we feel alive. Maybe it was when you made the team, or when you asked her out and she said yes. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was the birth of a child. Maybe it was landing your dream job. The point is that all of us can point to a moment, a, a point, a moment in time when we felt more alive than we ever have before. And we love those moments. We wish they could last forever. And today, we're wrapping up a series that we've been talking about, Five Awakenings, that can help us find our way back to God. These awakenings are not just something that happens that first time you come to Jesus, but they're awakenings that we continually need to come back to as Christ followers. And as I finish up this series, I guess I should also say I'm kind of excited today because this is my last sermon for a couple months. Um, we have some great speakers coming, some that have never spoken here before, some that are coming back, and, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say to us. And a preview, uh, I'll just go next week because I can't remember each week who's preaching, but I do know who's preaching next week. Next week, Madison Argetta will be back to share her testimony with us. So as we finish this series, I want to do a little bit of a recap on the five different weeks that we've looked at. Those five different awakenings we've looked at. The first one was awakening to longing, where we discovered our longings for love, purpose, and meaning. That, and they are given to us by God, and they're intended to lead us back to Him. And then the second week, we looked at awakening to regret where we recognize that we've tried so often on our own to fulfill those longings on our own instead of trying to fulfill them through God. And, and as a result, we've often trapped ourselves in an endless cycle of longing and regret. And it's in this awakening that we discover that we can always start over. 
The third week we looked at awakening to help. When, when we admit that we are powerless to fulfill those longings on our own, we discover that there is help. And help has a name, and his name is Jesus. And then last week we looked at awakening to love. It's that moment when we realize just how deeply God loves us. And we discover our identity as profoundly loved, unconditionally accepted children of God. So today, we're going to look at the fifth of these awakenings, the awakening to life. And when I think about this awakening, it reminds me of baptism. When I remember when I was baptized and when I've seen other people baptized, when they come up out of the water, that look of pure joy on their face. It's almost, you can call it a glow. It's, it's that moment that you awaken to life. And, but those are just moments. So often, the look of joy when somebody comes out of a baptistry, when times are tough, that, that glow is no longer there. Because the reality of life doesn't often feel very alive. Instead, it can feel far from it. Have you ever felt like you're going through life, but there's no life going through you? I know I have. So today, I want to address the question, how do we continually stay awake? To life. And each week, you know, we've, we've had a prayer to go along with each of these sermons. And the prayer for this awakening is this. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the confidence that I can live a brand new life. You see, Jesus came so that we could experience that life. In fact, he told his followers in John chapter 10, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. See, some translations say a rich and satisfying life or abundant life. So what do you think of when you think of abundant life or a life to the full? I know for me, I tend to think of the word more. A rich and satisfying life sounds like more, doesn't it? More money in the bank account, more money in the 401k, more satisfying relationships, more beach vacations. Merrily, that one was for you. As a culture, we love the word more. Marketers do this to us all the time. You get 25% more Doritos when you buy the jumbo bag and you get about 75% more air in that same bag. You get more cash back if you use this credit card. You get more frequent flyer miles if you use these dates. See, we connect fullness of life with more in our lives. But that's not what Jesus was getting at in this verse. In fact, the original language in the New Testament has two different words for life. One is the word bios. It's the root word that we get biology from. Bios means natural life. It can also refer to a chronological life. It's the average bios life includes 250,000 hours of sleep, 76,000 meals. All of that is part of that big bios life. And much of it can feel like going through life, but there's no life going through you. But there's another word for life in the Bible, and it's, it's the word zoe. Zoe includes that bios kind of life, but goes way beyond that. Bios is about quantity. More of the same. But, but Zoe is about a quality of life that comes only from knowing God. A Zoe life ultimately refers to eternal life, the kind of life that each of us 
we're made for that will never end. But a Zoe life is also about the quality of life that God has for us here and now. You see, when Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, guess which word for life he was using? Zoe life. Jesus is talking about a quality of life with God that changes our past, our present, and our future. Not just more of the same. You see, when you find your way back to God, you discover the Zoe life. And as you know, we've been looking at that story of the prodigal son throughout this series. And in that story, we've been looking, we see the contrast between a bios life and a Zoe life play out. Luke chapter 15, it says, To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. See, it's reflected in that unusual Greek word translated as wealth. The word is actually the word bios. It says literally in this verse, the father divided his life between them. It's as if the father is saying, I'll let you have all the bios life you can, that life can offer you. But someday, someday you're going to realize that more won't fully satisfy you. The bios life pales in comparison to the Zoe life, life with the Father. God doesn't want us to settle for the bios life when he created us for the Zoe life. The Father wants us to experience life to the full, life in and with him. We all have ideas about awakening to life might mean, but let's look at three experiences that the Father invites us to that to help us live out the Zoe life. You see, right before Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, he told two other stories in which those people also lost something of value. The first story is about a man who had a hundred sheep and he loses one of them. And he looks and he looks for that sheep and when he finds them, this is what it says. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Second story is about a woman who lost a valuable coin. She looks and she looks for it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Then the third story, the story of the prodigal son, the lost son. When the son finally nears home and his father sees him and runs to him and welcomes him home, he calls everyone together to make an announcement. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I hope you noticed something that happens in all three of those stories. When the lost sheep is found, when the lost coin is found, when the lost son is found, it happens. What was it? The news goes out. What was lost is now found, and it's time to celebrate. Everyone comes together for a party at the Father's house. If you have found your way back to God, then you have a good reason to celebrate. You were lost, but now you're found. You have been given the chance to make peace with your past. No matter what you've done, you can make peace with it. You've been given a purpose for living. You've been given hope for your future. See, if you want to embrace the Zoe kind of life, we need to party at the lost and the found. We need to consistently celebrate. 
See, celebrating God is something we don't do all that much. We think it's maybe irreverent to to celebrate God, but, but we're called to celebrate Him. And all that he has done in our lives and in, in, in our, as we grow in a relationship with him. Whether you're celebrating in a quiet place, alone, or with hundreds of people, God loves to spend time with you. In fact, the psalmist said, the Lord takes delight in his people. Do you know that that's how God feels about spending time with you? It's a delight to spend time with you. The simple fact that you're welcomed him into our day and chosen to celebrate with him delights him more than anything you could ever imagine. Not only that, it's, it's also a life giving to our souls. Celebrating is the first experience that helps us to live a Zoe kind of life. It's time we celebrate more. Edward Hallowell and his team of researchers at Harvard Medical School discovered that the two most powerful and meaningful experiences in life are one, achieving, meaning reaching a goal and accomplishing something worthwhile, and number two, connecting, relating to someone in a significant way. And according to their research, our society has become more and more obsessed with achieving while at the same time becoming increasingly bankrupt when it comes to connecting. Achieving, of course, is not a bad thing, but research shows it's no substitute for connecting. People who excel at achieving but fail at connecting end up unhappy people. People who prioritize, on the other hand, connecting in meaningful relationships, even if they're not great at achieving and accomplishing goals, they still report a fulfilling life. See, that research shouldn't surprise us because connecting is something God has designed us for. I don't think we can experience the Zoe kind of life without it. See, when we connect with other people who have found their way back to God, we discover that we're better together than we are on our own. In our new life with God, we all need the encouragement and the accountability of others in order to grow strong and to flourish in this journey. And while a large gathering may be great for celebrating, it's not always great for connecting. That's why small groups are so important. That's why Sabbath school is so important. Getting together with a small group of people and to get to know them and to connect with them. That's where Christ followers invest in each other's lives. The Father wants us to know and experience His love through a relationship with each other. See, when we intentionally and consistently stay connected to others, we're more likely to experience the Zoe kind of life that God intends for each of us. But there's one more experience that God invites us to where we can experience this Zoe kind of life. God has a dream for this world, and we are invited to be a part of it. His dream is that every single person would live every single second of their existence knowing that they are relentlessly and passionately loved. His dream is that every single person would experience the Zoe kind of life. His dream is that every person would find their way back to God. But here's the thing. God invites you to contribute to his dream. We have a part to play in his ultimate dream for this world. His desire is that you would willingly risk loving others because you know that God has risked everything in loving us. You have something to contribute to the dream of God. 
I've often wondered how the son who returned to his father would have lived from that day forward if John had continued the story. I doubt he would have looked at a hungry man or woman the same ever again. Or he would have listened to someone's story of failure and loss and sat there and judged them. Or thought that his father's wealth was all about buying him more things. You see, when we truly awaken to the Zoe life that God is offering us, we see the possibilities for our future completely different. Our priorities, they change. Life becomes about something that is better, bigger, and more meaningful than ever before. So to end this series, I actually want to tell you a story about a guy living this type of life. His name was Lane. Lane was a type A driven personality who would start his workday at 5 a.m. and not finish until late in the evening. His obsessive work paid off as his company became worth more than $9 billion when he stepped down due to a terminal illness. But that illness, sure, it brought an, that ambitious workaholic to a complete stop. When Lane paused long enough to reflect on his life and all of his success in the business world, he realized that there is something very important missing. See, as a kid, his parents would take him to church, and he had a genuine faith in God, but Lane realized that in his unbridled pursuit for success, God had gradually became a faint and a forgotten memory. But now, Lane was sick, the kind of sick that would slowly kill him. It would torture his body in constant pain. The illness was a wake-up call that something was missing from his life. He needed God. Lane said, the best thing that has ever happened to me was getting sick. Can you imagine that? Terminal illness was the best thing that ever happened to him. He said, from, from the time I got sick, it refocused me. It caused me to find my way back to God and to feel close to him. I would give, give up everything I have, everything, to have that relationship with God. You see, since his spiritual rebirth, Lane had been living a new kind of life. He's not a workaholic creating his own kingdom anymore. Instead, he's a messenger sharing his story and helping others find their way back to God. Elaine has one ultimate mission in life, in that life that he had left, to help people find their way back to God. There's nothing that will confirm your new Zoe life more than helping others find Jesus too. There's nothing like helping others find their way back to God. It, it will make you feel truly alive. You see, your, your new lifelong walk with Jesus is a journey. It's a journey you need to never travel alone. You, need, you never need to live apart from your Heavenly Father ever again. If you find yourself drifting into complacency, looking for substitutes, thinking that you have all the answers you need for yourself, you know what you need to do? You need to come back to a life that is really worth living. You, you know the way, and home is where you have always belonged. But be prepared. Be prepared in the years ahead for the kind of life that's different from anything you thought possible. Because when you made that U-turn on the road that day, and asked the Father for help. Christ has been alive in you. And that changes just about everything in our lives. So I encourage you to find your place 
in the community with other grateful sons and daughters of the Father. Connect with them, learn from them, and work alongside of them to help make a difference for good in marriages, in, in homes, in schools, in workplaces, and even in the communities at large. And together, let's keep helping others find their way back to God. See, that's where the real celebration is waiting for us. So my prayer is that you would refuse to simply go through life, but instead that you would let Jesus' life go through you. Heavenly Father, I want to end with the prayer for this week. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Awaken in me the confidence that I can live a brand new life. In Jesus' name, amen.